evening, everyone, and welcome to season four, episode four of the Green Table Talk on the topic, Checking the Receipts, Assessing Three Years of Biden's Climate Agenda. My name is Kayla Shannon. For those who don't know, I am your host, a senior at the illustrious Spelman College and an advocate for the city of Flint. Thank you to our Green Table Talk partners and sponsors, the New Jersey Black Empowerment Coalition, the Environmental Defense Fund, and the Climate Action Campaign. We are in President Biden's last year of his presidential term as nearly three years from today, he was sworn in as the 46th president of the United States. The Biden administration frequently talks about the unprecedented investments in climate and environmental justice through the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act, Inflation Reduction Act, two executive orders tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad, and revitalizing our nation's commitment to environmental, environmental justice for all. But after all is said and done, what are the receipts? Tonight's panel will assess if President Biden has truly lived up to his climate and environmental justice promises. Before we get started, please, uh, I'd like to introduce y'all to our panel. You, will, you know, we always bring the heavy hitters. So starting with Paul, if we could go down the line and introduce to our audience who you are and a little bit about yourself. Yeah, uh, my name is Paul Presendu from New Rochelle, New York, born and raised, the son of two immigrants. My mother's from Colombia, father's from Haiti, two proud members of the black community as Afro-Latinos. And I currently am the Director of Community Engagement for Soulful Synergy, a millennial minority-owned social enterprise and sustainable development, it's focusing on green-collar workforce development, engaging our most vulnerable populations, single mothers, previously incarcerated, people that have disabilities and historically have been underemployed, to make sure that they know that they have a space in our emerging green economy for equitable, sustainable development and the creation of more circular economies. Hi everyone, I'm Val Schul. My pronouns are Ege, they, them, and I'm based out of Binghamton, New York. Um, I am the Water Equity and Ocean Program Director at Green Latinos. Um, Green Latinos is a national comunidad of environmental advocates um, from all disciplines and all sectors of industry. Um, and part of the overarching goal of Green Latinos is to fight for environmental liberation. Um, and we're hoping to be able to uh, bring forth some of those wins that we've been talking about today um, for uh, th with the Climate Agenda and Justin 40 initiatives. But also, you know, we want to talk about how our communities still ha deal with the burdens of environmental injustice. So really excited to be here uh, to talk about this further and really excited to have an amazing panel with me as well. Excited to have you. Hello, I'm Briante McCorkle. I am the executive director of Georgia Conservation Voters. We work to organize and mobilize Georgians around climate and environmental justice issues. Um, that's primarily the work that we do. We mostly focus on energy because energy is Georgia's top area for carbon pollution reduction. That industry also has historically had an impact on black and brown communities in Georgia. So we want to make sure that as we are rebuilding and we're expanding into clean energy economy, that we are doing it in a way that's equitable and just and benefits all Georgians. Um, and yeah, I've been talking about federal money all week, um, all year, for several years. So I'm happy to be here talking about it with you all. I feel like this is a tremendous time for us, a huge step forward in taking action uh, towards climate, uh, addressing climate change. So yeah. Hey, thank you. I'm so excited. I always get like this giddy feeling before we start our panels because I know that y'all are about to give it to them. I'm looking forward <laughs> to this. Um, so getting started, one of the most groundbreaking investments from President Biden's climate agenda is the Justice 40 initiative, as has been referenced. For example, in October 2023, the Biden-Harris administration announced nearly $1.5 million for environmental justice projects in communities across Georgia as part of the Investing in America agenda. Since 2021, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous-led organizations have received federal funding that had, had, that had historically been deemed ineligible. To each of the panelists, share some specific examples of how frontline communities have benefited from Justice 40 programs. Um, yeah, I'm super excited uh, to talk about some of these investments in Georgia. There are groups that I've worked with for a really long time um, that it's, it's just, they are finally seeing um, investment in the work that they've been doing 
EcoAction is one group based in Atlanta. They've been around for several decades doing work in the metro Atlanta area, addressing um, environmental justice issues, energy burden, um, really doing the work to engage uh, black folks and low-income people in the metro Atlanta area in this work. Um, they were one of the recipients of the uh, recent round of environmental justice funding um, in Georgia. And so it, they're one very clear example of people I've been working with for a long time who are now able to really grow and expand their mission as a result of these dollars. Um, and so I know we're talking specifically about EJ projects, but I've seen all across states, communities like uh, Fort Valley, Georgia, which has a historically black college and university, um, really benefit as well from investments coming through. Uh, IRA specifically for school buses, there's like a, a bus manufacturing company there. Um, they've received a lot of support, are able to take advantage of the tax credits flowing through IRA and have been able to expand their operations, of course, creating tons of jobs in that community as well. Um, and so I could go on and on, but those are two very clear examples that stand out to me as communities that were intended to benefit from Justice 40, um, both a business project, but then also something that is community-led and community-organized, um, receiving resources to keep doing this work. Thank you. Yeah, so staff at Green Latinos um, are currently finalizing a report that analyzes investments from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act across five states with significant Latino populations, which include California, Colorado, Texas, Florida, and New York. And it examines 23 projects that fall under the Justice 40 initiative by the Biden administration and also address the Latina community priorities around public lands, healthy waters, and climate justice. And so from that report, Green Latinos has been able to highlight several examples in terms of uh, Latina and other communities of color benefiting from the IIJA programs. And so I could go into some examples, but you know, we've seen that there are multiple brownfield remediation projects that are located in cities with 30 to 50 percent Latina populations and those include uh, cities such as Los Angeles, Fresno, Denver, Houston, Tampa as well as the South Bronx. We also see that fence line air monitoring uh, grants are going to various grassroots and nonprofit organizations that are working in Latina communities to monitor air pollution and those include Comite CV Civico del Valle, which is in California, Centro Fronticero de los Obreros in Te Texas, and United Latino, which is also in California. Um, and the last thing I'd like to know is that there are some programs that are being able to fund uh, projects related and uh, related to supporting Latinas and students of color in sustainable agriculture and food careers, as well as increasing land capital and market uh, for indigenous farm workers. But oh, sorry, before I wrap up, the last thing that I also would like to know is that um, with all these successes, there's also um, an importance in terms of ensuring that barriers continue to be removed to access these funds. And that particularly comes when we think about small frontline uh, community organization. And so Green Latinos has also uh, offered webinars that we call Encuentros um, to provide technical assistance and guidance to securing funding for uh, grants such as the Community Change Grant and uh, provide additional information to the IRA and the IIJA. Yeah, um, the Justice 40 initiative has honestly been invaluable with helping us meet the economic demands for the social impact benefits of green jobs creation or overall to streamline our green economy. Our company, Soulful Synergy, is in our second year of receiving funding from the Department of Energy to provide technical assistance for people that are in federally mapped environmental justice communities to access vocational trainings or the skills needed so they become eligible local hires for municipal development so that they know about the clean tech that's needed, what if it's air source heat pump, ground source heat pump, or overall green construction practices so that the energy auditing and the energy infrastructure is retrofitted for clean technology implementation. Um, the work we've been doing has really put us in a trajectory of knowing not only what's happening in the grid now, but how we can envision where the grid should look like 10, 20 years from now, and how we could be forward thinking to ensure that residents in those communities don't lose out on those economic opportunities. Um, there's a reason why the communities became the way they are now, especially the communities that are predominantly black and brown. And while we do want to make sure that we have a sense of urgency addressing these issues, we got to make sure that we take a half step forward so the people that are in those communities are able to assume the job roles, whether if you're on the grounds as a, as a vocational technician, putting the screws into the ground or putting the, the, the two by fours up for framing, or you're the people that are architects or the environmental engineers putting together the scopes of work for the projects. Um, 
And you know, the ecosystem that we've been able to support has been invaluable. A lot of communities that we engage don't have a sustainability director, don't have an environmental engineer. Um, one community we work very closely is the city of Mount Vernon, who's led by Mayor Sean Patterson Howard, and you know her, National President of the African American Mayor Association. It's a city that doesn't even have a bond rating because of systematic neglect from previous administrations. So the Justice 40 really has helped us to be able to engage municipal officials, say we already have the money. That's a really big thing to be able to say to them because a lot of municipalities are really um, kind of bootstrapped or have um, economic, um, uh, I guess you could say, economic restrictions to be able to do these type of programming. So this is really invaluable for us to really not only help meet immediate needs, but help create brainstorming of projects that could be streamlined into communities meeting their needs for environmental infrastructure. That's so good to hear. Like, I, I think it's so important for us in these discussions um, as we talk about, you know, the state of politics, the state of environmental justice, and all of the injustices that exist in our system right now to also acknowledge the wins, right, which seem to be so few and far between. Um, and what sticks out to me is the fact that uh, black and brown communities who um, bear the brunt of these environmental crises, having the opportunity to regain agency and autonomy to also address them, especially in a place where um, where people talk about like um, the the green movement like taking away jobs, right? Like this idea that the green movement will be the the downfall of our economy, um, and it's reinforcing the fact that like no, not only is this movement um, helping to bolster our economy as it helps to build back a better uh, space for our uh, environment, but also it is creating spaces uh, for for the people who have been oppressed and suppressed in so many different ways to stand at the forefront of a new movement. Um, so the Inflation Reduction Act has some of the largest investments in clean energy, including solar, but it is a bit difficult for everyday people, especially folks in frontline communities, to clearly understand how to access these benefits. Um, so Briante, can you start us out in, in layman's terms for the folks like me who are not experts in this field um, and break down what provisions exist for solar uh, from the Inflation Reduction Act? Yeah, so when I saw this question, I was like, you want me to do one now? <laughs> um, so yeah, I can, I can do this. I'll take my, my best stab at it because, you know, this is, it's really complicated. Um, I just remember being at a stage where we were advocating for, you know, um, something to happen. We had majorities in Congress and we had a president that was friendly for climate action. And we're like, do something. And they're like, here, we did a thing. And it's like, what, <laughs> what do we have? Um, and so Inflation Reduction Act, um, this is the best way that I have under, to understand it. And if I have anything wrong, y'all, it's a lot to keep up with. So please correct me. Let's keep each other honest in the room. So $370 billion um, is what IRA is providing towards climate action. Of that $370 billion, nearly $270 billion of it is tax credits, the majority of which are business tax credits. So um, I know there's a lot of attention and a lot of focus on the grant side, but a lot of it is really figuring out all the different financial pieces that have gone into this thing, because that's really where they're adding up all these dollars. Um, so actual dollars into communities, like through grants, is just not going to be the bulk of it. The bulk of it's going to be how these tax credits are like leveraged creatively to like save money and the build out of this industry over time. Um, and so just thinking about, so going back to this pie chart that I have a visual of, I wish I could throw it up there, um, but it's three, 370 billion, 270 is tax credits. Um, most of it's going for clean energy supply. So like over half of that, 50% is targeted towards expanding the supply of clean energy. So what that means for solar is we have a lot of incentives to build out solar, solar projects, um, you know, to produce panels, to buy the panels and install them. There's tons of tax credits going towards that part. Of, of building out, but more than solar, there's money going for other forms of renewable energy, um, heat pumps, we also see wind as a possibility in many places. So the, it's not all solar, a lot of it's solar, um, but it's clean energy supply broadly that a lot of these incentives have been created to support. Um, and so I'm gonna go back to the tax credit piece because it's 270 billion of the 370, right? Focus on the gigantic. Um, the interesting thing about this is that they've just enabled direct pay for, uh, so basically what this means is instead of just applying for a tax credit, you can get that money back in cash, the cash value of what the tax credit would be, which is a game changer, I think, for a lot of people who want to build out this technology but don't have the resources 
and um, they're able to now, it's like when you file taxes, you expect a check back when you're making a certain amount of money. Um, you can file these, uh, file these credits, get the money back, and it really helps improve the economics of your solar project or your renewable project or whatever it is that you're doing in the clean tech industry. So um, figuring out uh, how communities can access direct pay, uh, access these tax credits is gonna be really important. Oh, I'm missing the big thing, which is that direct pay didn't used to be available for nonprofit organizations, and now it is available to nonprofit organizations. And we know nonprofits, at least I do, there's some really awesome ones all across the country who are really trying to um, do a lot of work to build out the clean energy industry and the vision and the way that we wanna see it, which is inclusively done. Um, and so them being able to access this money and not just try to give, convince corporations and businesses to do the right thing is really exciting. Um, and so, can I move on to the second Please, question? Okay. wait, so let me ask it, let me ask okay, it. Okay, so, okay. So staying okay, right there, yes, 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 yes. I'm, I'm excited with your I'm, I'm going somewhere, okay. We're like double dutching. Um, so staying right there, uh, the solar in industry is booming in Georgia, but how is the accessibility to frontline communities and black, Latinx, and economically disadvantaged communities? Okay, all right, so think about <laughs> what I was saying. Um, you know, the economics of these projects are gonna get better, there's gonna be more of them, right? There's a whole industry that's expanding with all these um, ideas on how to leverage this money and build out a uh, clean energy economy in our community. Some of that is creating new jobs, but also people are getting really creative about how to use this money to launch new businesses. I mean, we are talking about the clean, when we say clean energy, I think people fixate on solar, but they forget that there, there's an entire economy around the future that we're trying to build, right? One that really has people that know how to do solar, wind, microgrids, demand response, um, you know, all types of geothermal, like all of these things that are, are necessary for us. So there's there's the, tr the, the opportunity to really build out an industry and get in, not just get jobs, but also allow people to start and innovate and create new businesses is just really big with this tax credit. Um, I had a, a panel in our office um, yesterday, I was supposed to be here earlier, but I had to get my flight moved because I was like, I can't not be. At this panel, the Department of Energy Deputy Secretary came to visit Atlanta, and we put him in a room with a whole bunch of, um, you know, black business owners, um, Latino business owners. They were, you know, trying to get these projects off the ground, and just the ideas people had on, oh, I'm going to apply for this grant and then use this tax credit to like, you know, do this, I'm not gonna tell everybody's business ideas, but <laughs> you know, to do this thing in community that's gonna like really scale and have all this impact. Um, and so it, it's just exciting because, you know, what I'm supposed to say is, you know, there's been $30 billion of investment in Georgia um, towards climate, you know, clean energy jobs. Uh, th those investments have created about 20,000 jobs across Georgia. That's awesome. Some people are gonna get those jobs. The question is, are black and brown people gonna get those jobs? Maybe. I mean, you know, it's a, de it's a demographic thing. Also, we also know what that hiring industry looks like for traditional utilities. And you know what I'm saying? Like, some of them will get the jobs and they'll be on the billboards. They'll be in the stories. Mm -hmm. um, but not everyone will. So I really don't wanna, I wanna really play up this idea to like be innovators and create, creators and creating your own businesses using this money creatively and not just going to go get a job working for some other some solar company that's building out its 10th facility or whatever that might might look like um and i'll just say one more thing about the jobs you know we it's it's amazing i don't want to like 30 billion dollars and twenty thousand jobs nothing to sneeze at big deal um it's going to come to our communities some people get the jobs we also need to think about the broader impact of these industries as well um you know right now in you know at, all of these uh, solar, excuse me, all of this clean energy investments concentrated a big part of it near Savannah, Georgia, which is a you know m mostly black community, and they're getting a lot of warehouses clear cutting, et cetera, as a result of this. Oh, it's this, this new industry. It's like we're creating all these jobs, but they're like also destroying the quality of life in that immediately the immediate community where the, where the growth is being felt. So we got to be mindful of yes, jobs, but also. Let's start businesses. Let's use this as an idea to creatively build out the next economy, and also be mindful of, you know, that we're not perpetuating the same mistakes yeah. in the in the in the rush to build out a new clean economy that's going to have, you know, the same negatives that were there before. All right, I'm done. Yeah. No. No. Please take all the time you need, because <laughs> um, I think that's really important for us to recognize. Like 
we repeat history when we don't recognize the flaws in former systems, right? And so it's very important for us to be cognizant constantly that, yes, we want to build out this industry, but also how is it impacting the local communities that already exist? So thank you for breaking down that already very complex thing. Like, I think that was pretty good. We could put that on a TikTok or something. Um, <laughs> So New York has established a state legislative goal through the Climate Act, uh, which mandates all power generation to come from clean sources by 2040, including 70% from renewable energy by 2030. Real ambitious. Um, just in December 2023, New York turned on its first offshore wind farm with electricity generated uh, over the Atlantic Ocean now flowing to homes on Long Island. To Val and then Paul, while these sound like wonderful accomplishments for the state of New York, what are some victories and challenges you, uh, you have observed from a community level and government perspective? And what should be done to best address those challenges? Yeah, so in terms of wins, you know, according to the New York State Public Service Commission, more than 95.9 .9 million megawatt hours of energy have either been saved or are being generated by what they've deemed clean and renewable energy sources in New York State due to the Climate Act. Additionally, what we're seeing is that uh, community solar is becoming more common, which allows communities to uh, gain energy sovereignty and take an active role in terms of where their energy is coming from, right, and ownership. And so um, these are incredible wins. Um, however, some of those challenges that we mentioned um, is just, that though there's very ambitious goals through the Climate Act, um, I'd be interested to see uh, how we're doing in terms of meeting this uh, intermediate goal uh, of 2030. And so, um, partially because a lot of this Climate Act is focused on building up uh, wind and wind and solar and uh, if you're from New York you know that the largest time that you probably use energy is during the winter when it gets really cold <laughs> which is also coincides uh, when uh, solar and wind are probably amongst the lowest for New York State um, of course that's you know not to raise giant alarms because energy storage is improving and we're really excited to see that continue to grow in order to mitigate these um, gaps in terms of solar and wind. Um, additionally, New York State has a very large uh, energy portfolio that is reliant on hydropower, um, which has its pros and cons, which I also wanted to bring up. Um, and so part of this in terms of, you know, being able to reach this goal is uh, the building of the, what is known as CHIPI, the Champlain Hudson Power Express, which is a hydropower transmission project. Um, it, if you think about New York State, you know, the longest part of it is actually what goes all the way down from New York City up to Canada. And so basically the CHIPI project is, will be building out this transmission line down to the city, right, where there's need for energy, and all the way up to, to Canada, and that's about 336 miles along the Hudson River. And that uh, raises a lot of concerns uh, for communities as well as uh, environmental groups about the, the environmental impact and the overall um, benefit of the CHIPI project because it also fails to meet uh, basic clean energy requirements and will emit greenhouse gases after 2040. And it could have detrimental impacts both on the environment and the indigenous peoples. Uh, and we've already seen that uh, Hydro-Quebec, one of the major players in the CHIPI project, has had a content what could only be and I'm saying that nicely, contentious relationship with First Nation groups and indigenous groups in Maine and other places where they have already been present in terms of hydropower. And, um, and so, you know, that's not to say that hydropower is bad, but what I would really like to see in New York State is that we're not just replicating the status quo of having these burdens being put on uh, to black and brown and indigenous communities, similarly to fossil fuels. Um, what I'd like to see is that as we transition into renewable uh, energy, we're also taking into consideration that, you know, 100,000 people are reliant for their drinking water from the Hudson River and uh, making sure that these types of projects are not causing more harm to a very vulnerable, you know, and very vulnerable frontline communities. Um, and so I'm very hopeful that New York State 
um, we'll be able to take these into consideration. I know that you know um, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance has been very vocal about this project and pushing for community solar as a way to be able to uh, provide more energy. But it's a very complex problem. I understand New York City is you know very limited when it comes to being able to uh, you know generate energy um, and so there's but there's a lot of initiatives where people are thinking about floating solar they're thinking about uh, alternatives that are not having these detrimental impacts um, for the sake of meeting a, a threshold that has been set for it's really important to meet that threshold but it also is important to take uh, these uh, environmental justice impacts into consideration oh. yeah um, the the climate leadership community protection act of 2019 in New York really has started a renaissance of the decarbonization of residential and commercial properties while also creating, I guess you could say, a, a new dimension of socioeconomic support for a lot of the communities that were operating in a silo and didn't know what they could do. Um, I could talk about, you know, the community air quality monitoring that's occurring now throughout the state of New York in areas like New York City, Mount Vernon, New Rochelle, where I live, and also the city of Yonkers, where now you have cars um, being um, driven by ACLIMA that is now detecting particulate matter and pollutants, non-source and point source pollution so that we could be able to create forward thinking strategies to neutralize them through mitigation or just overall eliminate them by once you add identify what the source is in general. Um, also, you know, energy grid infrastructure creation, um, being able to, you know, implement programming such as community choice aggregations where municipalities to come together and create an electricity option, source from renewable sources uh, by like uh, source sources such as hydropower, so that we could be able to be able to offset some of the res residential electricity carbon emissions um, through, I guess you could say, a more equitable price um, for renewable energy access, where you're going to bid with five, five, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand residents in an electric utility grid, as opposed to one person looking to acquire renewable energy. So that pricing has been made more um, equitable and. Overall, just the funding that's being made available. Um, our, through, through our guidelines, um, we had to be at 70% renewable, as mentioned, by 2030. We also had to be at 100% carbon-free emission by 2040. And for us to get there, we had to really create the private-public partnerships that are needed to do the site feasibility studies, to be able to do the climate vulnerability assessments as well, too, for flying infrastructure, and most importantly, getting the funding to the communities. Um, just this past um, year, actually two years ago, in 2022, we passed a 4.2 billion dollar environmental bond act which is invaluable funding towards creating climate resilience and making sure that whatever economic burden that's being faced by municipalities isn't being placed on them which could impact youth bureau budgets or other um, needed services and i guess one of the biggest uh, flaws or one of the things that um uh, is a huge issue is that a lot of information isn't getting to the to the mindsets of our municipal mayors, town supervisors, or village leaders that are most closely connected to some of these issues. Um, I know being in government, it's it's tough. You're dealing with a whole spectrum of issues, whether it's homelessness, or you're dealing with um, 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 road infrastructure um, or sewage. Um, but you know, there really has to be a time that has to be dedicated for forward-thinking strategies and how you can onboard and need consultants or support services to be able to make sure that you know we're not looking at resolving these issues like a monolith, but we're really looking at the communities as as diverse and making sure that you're being intentional with creating a specialized sustainability plan for each respective community. Um, but regardless, you know, the, the renaissance is happening in New York. The work that we've been doing in green collar workforce has been invaluable, and we see the impact every day. Um, you know, we're, we're doing job trainings and providing career services to people that are in their 30s or 40s, and for the first time ever, they're getting a resume or a cover letter, and they're able to gain that confidence to create that five-year, ten-year plan of knowing that after they do this training, then they go to community college, and then you get your four-year degree, and then they're looking at creating their own LLC to be in the movement and pass something on to members of their family. Um, so. So, you know, I know that New York, there's a lot of eyes on New York. Our climate agenda is very ambitious. It's something that is not only helping lead a national agenda, but also is helping lead an international agenda through the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So it's really about us making sure that we come together. But 
as environmental educators. We could definitely all um, take time to sign up for public speaking comments at a village trustees meeting, city council meetings, and let people know what's coming down the pipeline so that we could really position ourselves to create the partnerships and ecosystems to secure funding through, um, I guess you could say, uh, uh, an act of desperation because the most vulnerable populations, there's real po real time repercussions from people that are not receiving the resources that are needed. And it doesn't have to be environmental orgs that you partner with to be able to secure and have these conversations. I speak to organizations like Disability Rights in New York, New York is a good gun violence, that could really be the better surrogates than I can as an environmental professional to talk about some of the systematic consequences of people not getting access to have a fair pursuit of their American dream. But um, I definitely do feel as if we're in a right time in history, we're in an unprecedented time that we can all come together and um, support each other with making sure that resources get where they're needed and that we're really able to make this momentum to really save our communities. Thank you. Whew, y'all, I'm saying this is a lot of great information. And what I really appreciate is that with each of your perspectives, you're offering um, such, a, such a diverse, um, like holistic view of what this is like it's not as simple as just going green right um which i think it, it has tried to be simplified even within the biden administration he, he's he's tried to make it very like oh you know we're, we're we're gonna build back better and we're we're we have all of these you know we have these initiatives and we have these plans and by this year we're gonna do this and by this year we're gonna do that but but on the underbelly of that right there there are still so many communities and there there's so much work that needs to be done there's so much work that is being done um, but but as you said we're in a an integral time in our society and really like th this this work is past due right so we're at we're at a time where we're working against the clock we were talking literally before we even went live we were talking about all of the different climate crises that are occurring across the country like we we are literally in a time where we are watching and ex experiencing climate change and also in a time where we're seeing even politicians continue to deny the what's right in front of us right and so it's so important that that we talk about the the complexities of the issue but also to empower community members to take agency right like there there are so many different community-based organizations that are interested to hear from community and interested to show up and work uh, together in order to ensure as as several of you have mentioned that we don't repeat some of the same um, mistakes that were made in in previous uh, energy structures so as we move forward, we can't ignore that in early 2023, the Biden administration approved the Willow Project, which is a massive $8 billion Conoco Phillips oil drilling operation on federally protected land on the north slope of Alaska's Brook Range. For more context, this Alaskan reserve also happens to be the single largest tract of undisturbed public land in the country, but located in a part of Alaska that is already enduring coastal erosion, melting sea ice, and thawing permafrost, whereas the Willow Project would ultimately make these problems worse. To all of the uh, panelists, but starting with Paul, why was approving the Willow Project counterproductive to Biden's climate agenda? Uh, and what implications does that have for other states, especially in frontline communities? When I heard the Willow Project was approved, I was very, very upset. Um, it, at least dismayed, to say the least, uh, because, you know, uh, Congresswoman Pelota, I had a lot of hope in her uh, being able to advocate for that. Um, Alaska is so uh, in proximity to the Arctic region and they're seeing real-time repercussions of the degradation of the Arctic region and the melting of the ice sheets and um, everything that's happening towards the natural habitat in that region. Um, to my understanding, even President Biden still has yet to appoint um, to confirm the nomination of Michael Strager uh, from the State Department to be our U.S. ambassador to the Arctic region as well, too. Um, and, you know, you know, the U.S., we're even part of the Arctic Council with like Denmark, Norway, Canada, um, Russia, uh, Sweden, um, where we could be able to just reverse engineer what are the best practices for energy infrastructure that's in that region. Um, Norway, what, like what, over 90% of their energy comes from hydropower, hydroelectric electricity sources, and there is a lot of potential for that um, infrastructure in Alaska, um, you know, through the, the numerous rivers and things in that, in that region. Um, so I feel like we kind of took the short road, you know, we did what we did a Band-Aid solution for the energy crisis as to really thinking about how we could invest energy towards creating that, those needed green electrodes in the grid throughout the state. Um, but 
it's really about where do we go from here? Um, you know, what do we do? Do we make sure that we continue to have these Band-Aid solutions, or is there a way to really create a forward-thinking strategy of what the energy grid in Alaska could look like, how it can be done, what's the economic barriers of that, and how can na uh, Native Alaskans be part of that? And I specifically say Native Alaskans because Alaska has a strong Native American population, and that land it was it is still um, was theirs. So I would like to see those Native American tribes and the Native American populations have ownership over those grids. We shouldn't have people that are uh, you could say um, developers coming from. Um, I guess you could say Ohio or coming from the East Coast, taking over uh, these economic opportunities for people that have historically lost their economic power in areas such as Alaska. Um, but the Willow Project is a dangerous precedent because that was a really, really great opportunity for us to lead um, leadership, especially with Congresswoman with Mary Pelota. She's, um, she's the co-chair of a coalition called the Blue Dog Democrats, which is a um, coalition of conservative Democrats, or you could say more moderate li liberals, who work across the aisle purposely to be able to get um, po um, policy that's supposed to be bipartisan or nonpartisan in nature. And I feel as if, you know, Congresswoman Pelota, um, sorry if she's going to hear this, um, she kind of did drop the ball on that ability to really, you know, work with the Republicans in the Senate that represent Alaska and figure out what could be the best solution. Um, and I, I do think there's still hope, um, but they're really about how do you create a forward-thinking strategy of what the energy grid could look like and how to best position people um, for that um, possibility. For example, um, in New York, um, once uh, a legislation was passed in 2021 um, that was calling for all cars that are sold in New York to be decarbonized, electrified by 2035. So we positioned ourselves to start EV trainings, where now we're in the process of training over a thousand people of how to do site feasibility studies and create the EV infrastructures um, so that they can know where the infrastructure can be done, how it can be done, implemented from Sunshine EV, so we could green the electricity sources for charging stations, and most importantly, how people could get jobs for those opportunities. So that type of kind of like 3D chess per se, or forward thinking strategies, has to be implemented in communities where we're not looking at sustainability plans, but we're looking at all dimensions of these social economic impacts to make sure it's a flawless strategy where people that are tripping it up are obviously not in, on the right side of history or care about the planet. Um, Paul, I love the fact that you mentioned that you took a shortcut, like that's basically what it is, is that this is counterintuitive to, you know, if we're checking the receipts, <laughs> you know, this is counterintuitive to these, uh, to these commitments to ensure frontline communities like ours aren't, you know, facing those uh, burdens in terms of the national investments uh, to dirty energy. And this is a band-aid solution at best, um, but the administration is unwilling to reject oil and gas extraction projects, that it's gonna be releasing uh, emissions that are dangerous, and we've already have seen that communities are facing these impacts, and uh, it's also ca causing us to lose invaluable natural resources, right? Uh, we're losing public lands, uh, the beauty of the public lands, we're losing the, and the commitment to conservation, uh, we're losing some biocultural importance of these areas uh, to the indigenous people. And overall, if we are going to be committed to environmental justice, that means that these, are, these things are taken into consideration, that the people who are connected to the land are in fact uh, also being given the access to steward it and, and, and when we listen to these communities, they are adamantly against these types of extractions. And so um, there needs to be a stronger commitment to be transitioning away from fossil fuels. Um, you, know, it's, you know, it's great to put more funding towards renewable energy, but with not coupling that alongside with a transition away, uh, we're only going to be exasperating the climate crisis. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everyone. Uh, it's a terrible project. Um, it's, it's really a trying to have a have your cake and eat it too approach. Um, we can't do both things. Um, we're in the middle of a climate crisis. I mean, at this point, the climate is already changing. Um, I keep, I like to speak in metaphors. So just like imagine you and your family are standing underneath a tree that's about to fall. And you, you know it's gonna fall. 
Um, I feel like Republicans are like, well, trees naturally fall anyway, so we'll just let it, you know, that's, their, that's where they are at on this issue. They're just going to let the tree fall. Um, but, you know, doing, drilling oil, drill, drilling for oil is like taking an ax to that falling tree, right? You're just, you're helping it fall. Why are we exacerbating the problem? We should be doing everything we can to mitigate the problem and drilling for more oil absolutely is not it. I think it's interesting it says on federally protected land because like what are we, what, is this protection? Is this what protection looks like? Who is this protecting? Um, it's not protecting us, it's not protecting the future, it's not protecting the land, not even the people who live in close proximity to this project. A lot of people in Alaska still live um, in a subsistence type of way. This is devastating the traditional systems that they're used to. Uh, weather patterns, all types of things are going to get disrupted, are already being disrupted, and will continue to be disrupted. So it's frontline impact and then global consequences, once again, right, that we're dealing with with Willow. And it, it's this type of inconsistency that makes it hard when I'm trying to tell people about the great stuff that like is coming out of IRA. Um, there's also this really toxic thing, and it's hard to support someone who has inconsistent receipts. Um, you know. There, it, there's no way around it. We, we are not going to win either in addressing the problem or even the political narrative if things like this continue to happen. Yeah, um, and I think these are important things for us to talk about in an election year, right? Um, because unfortunately, most of our politicians only speak the language of their power, right? So, so they only care to the extent that their power, their influence, or their seat at the table is threatened. Um, and so I think it's important, um, and, and you called it exactly what it is, like a Band-Aid solution, which our country is great at, right? We're great at throwing money at the problem. We're great at putting Band-Aids on gaping wounds. And we're great at, you know, or they're there. I won't say we because I'm not a part. <laughs> uh, but, but also great at just blatantly ignoring issues that are obviously impacting, especially frontline communities. Um, and so, and they use these hot button words, right? And they, they, they put these uh, things that they know that we're interested in on their agendas and they make these promises that they're ultimately unable to keep or uh, are just aren't held accountable to. And so I think it's important for us as an electorate to be very present um, in these discussions and educated about these inconsistencies in their platforms so that when we um, come to the voting booth or when we come to discussions in general, right, that we are willing to challenge like, all right, if you want my vote back, right if you want me to continue to support your platform that that there is that, that you have to be consistent that you have to be dedicated to the agenda that I nominated you for right that that you can't just say that that you support these communities but that you have to actively show up to the table and do the work and and and, and fight the fight right um, especially when it comes to like okay you're you're receiving pushback to uh, from some of the organizations that that make up a large portion of our economy, right? The, the organizations that in some ways may be supporting their com campaigns, but it's also like at the end of the day, you're accountable to the people who voted you into office. You're accountable to the people who who trust who entrusted you with their community, like that they've entrusted you uh, with their children. We're entrusting future generations to you. And then you make these sorts of uh, decisions that, as you said, like actively counteract uh, what you've said that you're fighting for. So while the Inflation Reduction Act has some good parts, which we've spoken about, uh, the bad parts are pretty darn bad. Uh, for example, the act extends billions of dollars of investments in carbon management products projects, which are largely unfounded and put already vulnerable communities at risk. The Department of Energy literally used the definition of disadvantaged communities to determine where these risky projects should be prioritized. Right near New Year's Day, the EPA granted the state of Louisiana power and authority to approve carbon capture wells. To all of the panelists, but this time starting with Val, uh, in your opinion, why is this investment and false climate solution not best reflective of Biden's climate agenda? Yeah, so investment and in you know, false solutions of carbon capture as and hydrogen are, again, <laughs> checking the receipts, a direct opposition uh, to values in terms of fighting environmental injustice and racism. Uh, Justice 40 has been used inappropriately 
uh, to put these uh, CCS projects in communities that suffered the most from air pollution uh, and from the that is being uh, produced by one of the largest polluters, which is you know major industries. Uh, CCS um, is also an industrial process. Um, so citing these projects. Uh, in these communities only further perpetuates the harm that these communities have already uh, been dealing with um, historically. And the other thing to know is that there's no regulatory regime at any level of government, local, state, or federal, that can protect these environmental justice communities from the cumulative risks and dangers associated to this sort of carbon management like CCS. Um, and with those weak regulatory frameworks, a lot of us fight these bad actors um, in order to be able to enforce environmental re regulations that are in the pro right, in the process, but without these being in place, it makes it really really hard to combat them. Um, the other thing is that you know there's a lot of huge financial in incentives um, for these types of projects and tax credits, um, and quite frankly, that's inappropriate investing in public tax dollars for these risky ventures that could, again, continue to perpetuate harm and there's not enough evidence to support that uh, our communities are not going to be impacted. I know very recently, you know, in terms of the work um, for ocean climate action and ocean justice strategy, there's a lot of, of discussion relating to using similar carbon management uh, strategies within these documents. And again, um, this is uh, similar to how we think about like offshore drilling. Like this isn't something that we should uh, be putting into our oceans um, and, and it would make it even riskier um, as considering the invaluable resource that the ocean is. And so, um, Overall, just to summarize, like what's being proposed at the federal level is truly undermining their efforts uh, in terms of ensuring that environmental justice is uh, being a priority for the administration. And um, you know, there are some good examples of state gains, which include the New Jersey Environmental Justice Law, the New York Cumulative Impacts Law, which was already mentioned, as well as like at a true like local city level of New Orleans that of the renewable and clean energy portfolio, and they passed the first prohibition on CCS. So there, you know, people are combating it, and uh, but it's very difficult to be able to say that the receipts uh, are demonstrating overall good. <laughs> I just like to like take a step back and like so. I, I was invited to, they're probably never going to invite me again. Um, <laughs> so a Southern company was like, come to you know, our headquarters in Alabama, I'm like, let's show you some things. OK. <laughs> I'm going to come see these things. And uh, one of the things they did was they took me to this carbon capture storage and recovery facility. And they were like, yeah. And I honestly didn't fully understand what it was. You know, it sounds so complicated. And they showed me this, this, this project, this demonstration project. And I'm like, wait, OK, so let, let me get this right. Y'all are gonna capture carbon emissions, liquefy them, and then inject it underground. Okay, 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 and, and we've never done this before. <laughs> we've never done this before. And why, are we, why do we think it's okay to inject underground? Oh, because well, this geo geologic formation, of these types of rocks. Okay, but like there's no guarantee that it won't spread. You know, it's liquid, liquid moves. We're on a planet that's you know, circulating, um, it's gonna move. Um, so, okay, so what happens to the communities above ground? Well, we don't, you know, nothing, so we don't know. Because we haven't done this before, we don't know. We don't know how, we don't know, we don't know. That was the answer to everything. We don't know how, how far it's gonna spread, we don't know how, um, we can't contain it, we don't know if there's any impacts for people on, above surfaces, and as you were saying, there's nothing protecting them, even if there were in the current law. Um, this is like when they were like, fracking safe, it's fine. We're just gonna like throw some bombs underground, blow some stuff up, it'll be good. And it wasn't good, right? Like people's groundwater got polluted. There were sinkholes everywhere because we were destabilizing the literal surface of the planet, blowing things up to get gas. This is expensive and unnecessary. That's what it is. It's also not a guarantee to work. They, they really haven't demonstrated that it's effective, that they're gonna be able to pull everything out of the air. And the cost of building these things is just insane, right? It's, it, it's, and who's gonna pay for that? Who do you think is gonna pay for the construction of this carbon capture plant? The tax credits are gonna help, but they're not gonna cover everything. All of this is gonna get passed on to the rate payer. They're gonna be paying for this risky thing, financing these risky projects that aren't even guaranteed to pull all the carbon they promise 
out of the air. What it does is by allow, by saying, hey, this thing exists and, and we can make it work, what you're doing is you're giving a pass for all of these polluting product projects to continue to go forward because it's okay, we'll, we'll capture the carbon and we'll inject it underground and it'll be fine. Okay, I, I'm just saying, it, it's, it's a little insane, you know, for the amount of money that we could spend on this. How about we spend it on stuff that we know doesn't have any of these side effects, like solar, like renewable, like micro grants, like demand response, like energy efficiency. There's a million things we can do that cost less, that have less, you know, externalities and unknowns. This is just, it's risky and it's just a once again, let's try to have our cake and eat it too. And all of the above, we can still burn the gas. We can't still burn the gas, okay? You just, okay, all right, I'm done. I see my thought on that. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's true, um, you know, with these practices, with carbon capture technology, it definitely leaves us vulnerable for potential greenwashing uh, and not really doing what needs to be done of decarbonizing our grid and decarbonizing our supply chains for public services, whether it's like EV garbage trucks or, or EV buses um, and learning best practice from other areas. Um, like, for example, like Norway has um, their entire um, their, 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 their train system is powered by wind turbine energy. So how, why, what's, ta what's preventing us from being able to implement those type of prototypes here domestically in the United States of America? But if we're using funding for those type of projects of carbon capture technology, then that's pretty much us just shooting ourselves in the foot and just throwing in the towel and not doing what needs to be done. Um, I, I recently went on an environmental justice tour uh, for the city of Newark, New Jersey, and I was looking about the ironbound community and seeing how you have incineration plants next to uh, uh, airports, um, next to processing facilities. Um, you, you have people that are shipping their garbage from New York City, Manhattan, to Newark, New Jersey, and it's being trapped, incinerated into the air, increasing rates of cancer, incre increasing rates of asthma, and literally just shortening the lifespans of, of, of a community that's predominantly black and brown. And what, why, in, in, what, why would you, instead of looking at neutralizing those carbon sources of emissions and just put up some stacks to be able to capture the technology, I think that would be extremely disingenuous, um, especially for communities that really are looking um, for being able to save their planet and save their property values to pass their homes on to future um, generations. Um, so this carbon capture technology, um, don't really, I'm not a strong advocate of it at all, and I think that those resources, economically or through overall, I guess, engineering sciences, should be better allocated towards how to really decarbonize the grid, making sure that we build the energy capacity that's needed, and how we're able to kind of provide public services without compromising um, any carbon emissions and making sure that we're reading, uh, reaching as close to net zero as soon as possible, especially in our most vulnerable communities. And listening to y'all, it just has me thinking like, so who are they asking? <laughs> like, so like, so like, who's making these decisions? Because like, I've had so many different conversations with environmental advocates, with people who work in this space, who are like, that does not like does not make sense. Um, and it's 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 so important that again, it goes back to like, um, to to making sure that that people at the ground level are very aware, right? And understand what impact that they are able to have and how they can intervene in these systems because it's very obvious that like the the voices of the people who are being impacted and the voices of those who advocate for the communities that are directly impacted are not being heard or prioritized in these conversations. And so we, we literally have to for the sake of our communities, for the sake of our children. Um, I was talking to Tracy and it was like, oh my gosh, I feel so bad for the babies. Like I feel so bad for our babies' babies. Like um, we had a panelist, um, I think it was last year that, that talked about an indigenous practice to try to consider every decision you make seven generations forward, right? And it's like, if we think seven generations forward from now, what earth are we, what earth are they going to inherit? Will there be an earth for them to inherit? Will there be a place inhabitable? Something that we can be proud to give them, right? Like a product that, that, that they can thrive in, like an area where, where they can be confident that like I could raise children here, right? That like, that, that I could personally survive here, that, that I'm not like handed a death certificate right next to my birth certificate, basically. Like that's, that's the point, that's the reality that, we, that we're living in now. 
Um, so as we get close to the end, um, I, I just, we always like to end our shows with um, leaving our audience feeling empowered. Something that, you know, we, we've given them the good, we've given them the bad, and now let's give them something empowering. Um, in 60 seconds, or um, somewhere around 60 seconds, right? Um, how can we hold the Biden administration accountable to his climate promises, especially, again, in an election year? Don't all jump in the <laughs> I don't know if I can do that in 60 seconds. <laughs> do your best. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Um, okay, so I think it's incredibly important that you, um, I would, I, okay, so the easy thing is to say go vote, right? That's so easy. People tell you to do that all the time. Definitely go vote. I'm not here to tell you not to vote. Voting is incredibly powerful. I want y'all to focus on down ballot races because the president is not everything. There is a whole stack of elected officials down ballot who are making incredibly important decisions. I mean, Biden did what he could. We got the Inflation Reduction Act. He's like, here, I did, this is the money. And all of it's coming to state and local government. And there's a ton of elected officials who don't, they're not, I mean, they're just asleep at the wheel. Um, and, but there's some good ones who want to do good if they know that they're supported and they have the right information. So we don't come out, we don't vote for those races. Those, vote, those races are won on very small margins. Um, please take some time to get to know what's happening in your local and state government. These are people you can talk to, you can see, they go to the, the grocery store down the street. I can't tell you how many times I'm be like, oh, got to look right when I go to the store because I'm going to run into like 80 elected officials because they're all local. Focus down ballot, please. That's that's what I think you can do to, to hold. It's hard because it's like Biden is, you know, the administration is the administration. But I, if I'm going to tell you what's more powerful, I'm going to tell you get local. Focus local. Build relationships with people you can see and talk to and corner at the grocery store and ask them why they did or did not do what you needed them to do for your community. That's the most effective form of accountability. Yeah, um, I agree. I also think, you know, uh, reach out to your representatives. We do have environmental justice champions. Um, it may often feel like, <laughs> like that's not the case, but it's really important to be able to send out letters uh, and Honestly, if you feel like you're nagging them, you're doing the right thing. Um, and I understand that you know people have a variety of capacity and responsibilities that may make it more difficult. But even if it's just writing postcards, there's various like local groups um, that will aid in the process. They have templates, um, have various calls to action that may be as big or small as you have the possibility to do. Um, you know, I don't have any much more to say than that, but the other thing is be loud uh, about the fact that uh, Biden, the Biden administration is, you know, for a receipt outside of this, but in terms of environmental justice, is funding a genocide in Palestine, and being able to be loud about that and to demonstrate that uh, dropping bombs and funding war is not environmentally sustainable, but also it's a human rights violation. So just something that I figured I should add. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with my panelists about kind of how we view government. Uh, we got to change the paradigm. Like it's kind of like an upside down period. A lot of people see it. it's the president that does everything as opposed to looking at the local level, regional, state, and then your federal representatives. So definitely making sure that we do the best to empower communities um, for a climate agenda so that we can all work side by side together um, with, I guess you could say, a climate agenda. Um, if you have um, ethnic or religious groups that vote as a block, then they should be able to have that same, same potential for a climate agenda or a climate community to make sure our best interests are being heard at the ballot box for people that took the time to listen to us and are willing to carry that, that advocacy into legislative practices. Um, in, in New York State, uh, we actually have a provisional law that allows us to establish citizens, community advisory committees for climate cl um, policy. Uh, conservation advisory council is a, pro is a proper term. Um, it's, it's Article 12F. 
um, subsection 239X of the New York State General Municipal Law. Um, I'm actually the chair for that in New Rochelle, and it was a Wizard of Oz moment for me, where it's like, you know, I'm able to see behind the curtain of how government works, and like I realize, wow, my mayor is not really that scary of a person. They just don't know better. So I think it's really about us taking the time to really just be the educators and really tap into the positive ego. Like I have to say with a lot of politicians, politicians have egos, so we gotta really tap into the positive spectrum of it, seeing what they campaigned on, what is it that they wanna do, and how we can help them, I guess, implement the best practices in terms of climate policy by making sure that not too much of the socioeconomic burden is being placed on them or the constituency. Um, because right now, the way things are trending, the cost of living is going up, we're losing our, 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 our resources in terms of, nat uh, in terms of natural um, resources from air quality, water quality, um, water's now a commodity on the New York Stock Exchange, and, and people are now having conversations about purchasing bottled air from Canada. So, you know, unless we do what needs to be done now, we, it's really going to be a detrimental um, setting for future generations that look like us looking to live, breathe, and thrive in our communities. But definitely empowering um, communities so that we can hold our mayors accountable, hold our county executives accountable, hold our governors accountable. That ultimately will create the infrastructure that will have a president um, not able to ignore our best interests, especially during the presidential year. Um, the swing states are very important. Um, we know that New York is always going to go blue. Texas always go red. California, maybe, oh, sometimes, well, I guess we see what's happening in there. Or California will always go blue, but definitely states like Michigan, states like Pennsylvania, Georgia, um, these are really the key states where it will be powerful to really set what an environmental agenda um, could look like um, for our nation for the next four years. Um, and to that point, and as we close out, um, as we turn the pyramid right side up, it's also important to notice that we as the electorate are the foundation of our democracy, right? And so like, you matter. It's so important that, that every single audience member understands the power that they hold individually, but much more, even more so, the power that we hold as communities, right? So rally, even if it's with your family, right? Make sure that you are not the only person in your household and your immediate family, you know, tell your grandma, tell your, tell your uncle, tell your cousin, tell your friends, um, go to vote in, in groups, right? Like make it a party, make it a fun thing, go get dinner afterwards. Like make sure that you are rallying amongst your community and educating those around you because I cannot emphasize enough the importance of us as an electorate. Like we, we have allowed too much power to fall on our elected a leader our elected leaders who should be accountable but they're accountable to us and they're only as accountable as we speak to them right like like as they are held accountable again they speak in power and influence many not all but many of them um, and so with that being said get out to vote get registered to vote get your family your friends your folks all of them go out and vote this year um, but also as everybody else has said just get active in whatever way works best for you this has been the Green Table Talk. We're here every fourth Thursday. Join us back here. Thank y'all.